I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. Luke 15 is where we're going to be today as we continue our Just Jesus series. Uh, We spent the year in the Gospel of Luke kind of looking at Jesus, watching Jesus, listening to Jesus, seeing how he interacted with people, listening to the things that he taught. Uh, If you don't have a uh, Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. They look just like this one. Turn to page 1039 and you will find the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. Also, if uh, you want to read the Bible and you don't have a Bible, then feel free to take one of those with you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know that if you do that, it will change your life. Um, Luke 15 is where we're going to be. Hey, uh, by the way, while you're turning there, I just got a confession. I'm a loser. <laughs> you know, and by that, I mean uh, I lose stuff. Uh, is anybody else a loser in, in here too? You lose some stuff? Okay. See, for me though, I, I don't just lose generic stuff. I lose sentimental things. In fact, the more sentimental the gift, the more likely I am to lose it, which does not work out well in relationships. So, for instance, my wife and I had been dating for about four months. We hit Christmas, the very first Christmas. You know, that first Christmas gift is really important, I guess. And, um, and so uh, she gave me a sweatsuit, real nice sweatsuit. I didn't have one. Uh, and so uh, with, within a few months, I lost the pants. And she was incredulous. She was like, how do you lose the pants on a sweatsuit? Well, because I had shorts on underneath them, and I got hot, and I took them off, and I don't know where I left them. You know, we're playing basketball or something, and they're on a court someplace. And, and uh, I just, I lose stuff. I lost my wedding ring uh, the first time uh, when we were, like, uh, on our eighth anniversary. <laughs> Some of you guys caught that first time, huh? Uh, and I took it off so I wouldn't lose it, and I lost it. Uh, but the worst thing that I've lost is Bibles. I, you know, uh, you guys might notice I'm a, I'm a pastor, and so I like Bibles, uh, and, and I would pick out these Bibles that I wanted, and Merelda would buy them for me, and she would engrave them with my name on them, and I would lose them. And, uh, and I had, uh, I mean, this first one she gave me, it was great. It was this real small print, small Bible. It fit in my pocket and all this kind of stuff, and I, I could read it back then. I lost it, don't even know where. Uh, this other one she gave me uh, was, I, I loved it. It was perfect for youth ministry. It was, it was great size and everything, had my name on it. Took it on a mission trip, lost it. Knew where I lost it. They found it. They sent it to me. I took it on another trip and lost it again. <laughs> Which is why the Bible and the seats look amazingly like my Bible that I use. Because this is what I use. I use the same Bibles you guys have because nobody cares if I lose this one. Nobody knows it. I just wander out there, grab another one, and use it. It's amazing. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'd say I don't lose these, but I really don't know if I do or not because uh, there's a lot of them around. So uh, I'm a loser. And today we're going to look at two parables that Jesus told that tell us that God delights in finding the lost. God delights in finding the lost. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents." God delights in finding the lost. And we know this because Jesus tells us stories about a guy who lost a sheep and went looking for it and found it. And and a a lady who lost a coin and she's cleaned her house until she found it. And he tells us this so that we know that God is looking for lost people. 
God is looking for people who've lost their way, who've taken wrong turns, who've ended up trapped or abandoned or hopeless. Jesus wants to find you. And God's looking for people who've lost their way, who've, who've lost their moorings, drifting far from their values and the people that they were raised with. And God is looking for people who've lost their connection to him, who are wandering in that spiritual wasteland, searching for meaning and purpose and reason and value in life. So if you're not where you want to be today, if your life is off track, if it's hit rock bottom, if you kind of are in that place of being hopeless, maybe your life is just listing badly, understand that Jesus is looking for you. And he can't wait until he finds you. So God delights in finding the lost. Two thoughts with this. And, and these are thoughts uh, that may impact you in a really powerful way. Uh, I know they did me. Uh, and they're not in your notes, so you may want to write these down. Real simple statements. First thought is this. God wants you. God wants you. He, he desires you to be in relationship with him. He wants you in his family. He wants to forgive you. He wants to bless you. He wants to heal you. And then he wants to send you out to help him find others. God wants you. In other words, before God, you are not disgusting. You're not gross. You're not repulsive. You're not hideous. And, and I just want you to pause and reflect on that truth. Because do you really understand that God wants you? You see, when that truth hit me, it changed just everything about my life. I don't remember if I was in church or if I was reading the Bible or whatever, but when that reality that God wanted me, it changed my perspective about how I saw life. Because as I grew up, I, I affectionately now call it, I was kind of like the king of rejection. Okay? And I wasn't the one rejecting people. I was the one receiving the rejection. Uh, I've shared before, I moved a lot as, as I was growing up, so I was always the new kid. And so I was always trying to fit in some place that I didn't belong, that I didn't know people, and I wanted to know people, and I wanted to belong, and since I kind of liked people, I tried really hard to fit in, and, uh, and most of the time I didn't. Most of the time I got rejected. And then I got a little bit older, and I hit the teen years, and you know what? I developed this affection for people of the opposite gender. And I wanted to be close to them, and they didn't always reciprocate. And so there was a lot of rejection, and some of you are going, yeah, yeah, sure thing. Well, let me just put it this way. Uh, in this small frame of reality, my wife, the lady who married me, who said, you know, till death do us part and all that kind of stuff, in high school, three years in a row, she turned me down for homecoming. Yeah, but I won because she, she married me. Uh, just, but there was a lot of rejection. So, so this is my, you know, kind of life growing up. There's a lot of rejection. And then one day it became clear to me that the God of all creation, the God who made heaven and earth and everything that exists, the God who, who gave himself for us on the cross, that God loves me, wants me to be part of his family, wants me to be one of his servants, wants me to, to help him find those who are lost. And that same God that wants me wants you. He wants us in his family. He values every single person here. So if you're sitting here and you're feeling devalued, you're feeling like nobody cares, uh, understand God wants you. He wants you. Because once I realized that God wanted me, it didn't matter whether anybody else rejected me or not because I've been accepted by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It changes our perspective. I want you to understand God wants you today and also that we all need to be found. We all need to be found. In other words, we're, we're all lost. Now the question is, what tense do you need to be found in? What tense? And that may not make a lot of sense, so let me explain. Some of us in this room were lost. In other words, we've been found by Jesus, and we know it. And Jesus has forgiven our sins, and he's changed our life, and he's our Lord and our Savior now. And we know that we were lost, and now we're found. So we needed to be found past tense. We were lost. Others of us in this room are present tense, needing to be found. You are lost. The question is, are you in that process of being found? 
Are you ready today to call out to Jesus and kind of say, hey, I'm over here and I want you to find me and I want you to change me. I want to be a new person and I need your help to do that. Because he'll do it. Because God delights in finding the lost. And because God delights in finding the lost, God's mission is our priority. God's mission is our priority. Let me be really clear, because I, I think these parables make it really clear that, that God's mission is the priority. That, you know, that he wants us to join him in the seeking and saving the lost, finding the lost, and, and bringing them back home so that we can rejoice. And, and, and God wants to do this, but if the parables aren't clear enough, hear the words of Jesus himself. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, right after Zacchaeus has experienced this life-changing relationship when he's been found, Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. He said, this is what I'm all about. I want to seek and save that which is lost. And, and then hear the words of Jesus, what's often called the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, when he said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. So God wants his people to join with him in finding those who are lost. So God's mission is our priority. That's why at Calvary, we put it this way. Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. Now, you guys have heard that before. If you've been here any length of time at, at all, you probably have it memorized by now. You probably can fill in the blanks without me, you know, putting it up on the screen or saying it. Uh, but if you're new to Calvary, this is our why. You want to know ca why Calvary is the church it is? It's because of the mission. You want to know why we worship the way that we do or why we serve the community the way that we do? It's because of our mission. You want to know why we invest in children's ministry and family ministry and, and our student ministry? Uh, why we blessed 170 of our, our members to be up in the Wallapies this weekend at family camp. Why we uh, have a Christian school with uh, about 180 students in it offering excellent education. It's because we want to lead boys and girls, men and women, to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. You want to know why we offer the ministries that we offer, why we make the decisions that we make, or why we are crazy generous as a church? It's because God's mission is our priority. God delights in finding the lost. We're going to do that too. That's what we're going to be all about. And it wasn't always that clear, and it wasn't always that simple. Because uh, we had to kind of fight for this value. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here for very long, uh, over a decade ago, we started making significant changes in our church where we said, hey, we're going to be more uh, concerned with reaching the unchurched rather than just collecting Christians. And, and so we changed things. We changed worship styles. We changed our focus, what we started doing. The way we dressed, all of that stuff changed. And we started seeing people experience this life-changing relationship with Jesus. And, and it was exciting as people were coming into the church. But I just got to be honest, there were some people in our church who'd been here for a while at Calvary who didn't like the changes. And, and see, I know that none of you would ever be like that because I know we change stuff now. But you guys never grumble about it. You never complain about it. You're never upset by it. None of that at all. So it's, it's totally different now. But, but then people, you know, got upset. And so there was, uh, there was some conflict. And there were some accusations that were made that were kind of directed at me. And, and I was told I was too evangelistic. I was told that there were too many unchurched people, too many lost people coming into Calvary. And, and I kind of said, thank you. Isn't that great? Uh, you know, I, I kind of said, I don't think God's going to accuse me of being too evangelistic. But, but here's why I knew that, that at that moment I was in good company. Look back at Luke 15, 1 and 2. The, the, the reason Jesus told these parables. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Okay, so in Jesus' day, the religious elite didn't like the people that were coming to hear Jesus talk about life, talk about hope, teach them how to live, teach them how to connect with God. The religious people didn't like the fact that there were tax collectors and sinners showing up. So when somebody said to me, we got too many tax collectors and sinners showing up in our church, I kind of figured we're in good company. I'm going to be okay with that. So I'm glad all you tax collectors and sinners are here today. 
Thanks for being here because, you know, you want to come and hear Jesus. And see, what I realized is that religious people, and, and by that, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of people who love Jesus who are very religious. Uh, and, and the reason that a lot of churches are not growing and experiencing life change like we are is because a lot of religious people talk about finding the lost, but they don't actually like it when it happens because stuff changes. And I want you to know we're serious about God's mission here. So serious uh, that during that time of conflict, I realized, and, and I kind of said it to the staff, kind of told them, uh, hey, this is our value and we need to, to live it and be okay with it, that we will trade two Christians for one unchurched people any day of the week. We will trade two people that are saved for one lost person any day of the week. And some of you might be going, why would you, why would you say that? Well, because that's the trade that we made. We said, look, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you know Jesus as your Savior, you know you're going to heaven when you die, great. Your family, you're in. Uh, we're going to be in heaven together. That's going to be awesome. It's going to be wonderful. There are lots of churches you can worship at. But there are not a lot of churches that are investing themselves in finding those who are lost and welcoming them and in involving them and introducing them to the Savior who can change their life. And Calvary is going to be one of those churches that is relentlessly seeking after those who are lost. That's the church we're going to be. And uh, I'm glad you guys like that because that makes me feel like you won't leave then. Um, but... Uh, because, you know, that, that always hurts. And, uh, but we're serious about God's mission. And Calvary is going to be that church that is relentlessly seeking after those who don't know Jesus, who need to be found. And, and let me just tell you what I get really excited about. You know, I love, you know, wandering around before the service and saying hi to those of you that are on time. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to meeting some of you that are late. Uh, but... Uh, but, but here's the thing. I, you know, I love just kind of hanging out and saying hi, but here's what get, just gets me the, the most excited. When somebody says, hey, these are my friends. These are my friends. You know, because for the last year and a half, I have harassed you and said over and over and over again, hey, when we get in Sweetwater, why don't you guys bring three of your friends? Bring three of your friends. Bring three, if all, we all bring three of our friends, wouldn't that be awesome? And a lot of you have done that. And, and I love it because sometimes some of you are like, here's my friends. And it's like they want to say friend one, friend two, friend three. <laughs> if I had gold stars, I would give them out. Because I, I think that's awesome. Because here's what I know. If you bring three friends, you'll bring more. Because once you start bringing friends and you start seeing God change your lives, you kind of go, this is exciting. I'm going to keep bringing them. I'm going to keep doing this. See, uh, God's mission is our priority. And God delights in finding the lost. And we're going to be that church that does that. And finally, I want you to know that heaven celebrates life change. And so will we. Heaven celebrates life change. Look again at the parable. Verses seven, uh, parable 7 and 10. First of all, verse 7, Jesus said, Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Remember, he's talking to uh, the Pharisees, the, the people who are religious elite. And he said, heaven gets more excited about these people, the tax collectors and sinners that are coming to repent, than about you religious people that think you don't need to repent. Because they just think they don't need to repent. Because we know that Scripture tells us that there is none who is righteous, not even one, and that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when Jesus says, uh, then, then about the 99 righteous, there aren't 99 righteous. There's not even one righteous among us. But heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. Look at verse 10. Jesus again says, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Um, here's what it looks like. Heaven grieves our rebellion. Heaven grieves our rebellion. When we rebel against God, when we choose to do life our way, when we say, God, I, I'm going to live by my terms, uh, I'm going to live by my values, not yours, then we rebel. And when we rebel, it always leads us to destruction, to pain, to sorrow, to brokenness. It, it, it never looks that way at the beginning, but that's where it always leads. And heaven grieves that. 
But heaven rejoices when we repent, when we turn to God, when we follow Him, when we love Him, when we serve Him, because now we are walking in the blessings that God wants to pour out on His children. And so heaven celebrates that. Because God delights in finding the lost. And when He finds us, there's no lecture, there's no reprimand, there's no, I told you so. Just the joyful embrace of a child coming home. So, if you're far from God, don't fear being found. I know some of you kind of go, I don't know, God's going to be pretty ticked at me. I've been living, you know, against His will for a long time. I've been disobeying for a long time. God's pretty, pretty angry at me. I know this because a lot of people say, well, if I went to church, the roof would fall in. And I tell them about our construction. You can see the steel. It's all good. But... But what they're really saying is that we anticipate that God's angry at us. We messed up. And, 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 and we feel like God should be angry at us. But the truth is, He's not. I want you to know God's not angry at you. He's not angry at your rebellion. He actually grieves the pain that you're experiencing. That's why He sent Jesus to take the pain from us. Do, do you realize that's what Jesus did on the cross? When he suffered and died for us, that, that there was this transaction taking place where Jesus took our pain, our brokenness, our sin, and took it on himself. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 actually says, God made him who knew no sin, Jesus, the sinless one, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, he took all of our filth, all of our brokenness, all of our sin on himself, and he gave us his righteousness, his purity. How beautiful is that? The reason that we get to go to heaven is because of that transaction, because Jesus took our filth and gave us his cleanness. And, and we can celebrate that because that means that, that God wants to find us and give us that gift of life. So if you're far from God and you're thinking, ah, I don't know if I can come home, I'm not sure that God wants to find me. He wants to find you. In fact, he's waiting to throw a party to celebrate you. Have you been found? Here's the thing. If, if you're far from God and you're thinking, hey, maybe you want to be found, uh, after the service, there are be members of our prayer team here at the front. They would love for you to come and share that with them. They will pray with you and celebrate with you. There are pastors who are, are going to be at the Connection Centers, and we would love to visit with you and hear about your story. But reality is you don't need to wait for any of that. Reality is if you're ready to say, Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my Savior, and I need you to change my life, and I commit myself to follow you, right now just have that prayer in your seat. Just talk to God. God will meet you there, and he'll change your life, and heaven will start the party without us. Just one favor, tell us after the service so that we can rejoice with you. But if you're far from God, don't be afraid of being found. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, you believe that He died on the cross to pay for your sins, that He was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then, then understand this, please, that joy is connected to mission. Joy is connected to mission. By the way, how many of you would like to have a little bit more joy in your life? Okay, I want to meet with all the people who didn't raise their hands and find out what you're doing to have too much joy in your life right now. You know, because I really haven't met anyone who's going, hey, life is too good. I need to hang out with some depressed people and kind of drag me down. I need some really negative people in my life to, you know, kind of you know, balance me out because I got too much joy going on. Okay, we want more joy, and, and we need to understand that joy is connected to God's mission. We, we get this from the parables. They make it really clear. The guy was looking for his sheep. He found the sheep, and what does the Bible say he did? Yeah, he rejoiced. I'm glad three of you were listening. And, uh, and then the, the lady was looking for her coin, and she found her coin, and what did she do? She rejoiced. And, and when one sinner repents, what does heaven do? Yeah, they rejoice. They rejoice. You see, joy in our lives is connected to our involvement in God's mission. Which means that, that we need to, to understand some big misconceptions that a lot of us have. Uh, the first one is, is kind of universal. Satan convinces us that we will be happy if we indulge ourselves. 
that we'll be happy if we get what we want, and we'll be happy if we do things for us. In other words, Satan tries to convince us that we will be happy if we're selfish. Now, it, we don't ever look, think about it in terms of selfishness. We just think, hey, I'd be happier if I had more money. I'd be happier if I achieved this thing. I'd be happier if I got to do this, experience this, acquire this, have this. I'd be happier if the people in my life did what I wanted them to do. No one ever thinks that, right? About your kids? Your parents? Yeah, you know, whoever? You see, it's a lie that we buy into without even realizing it that we actually believe that our happiness is going to be contingent on us getting our way. And here's what Scripture makes really clear. Joy never results from selfishness. You want joy in your marriage? Stop being selfish. You want joy in your family? Stop being selfish. You want joy at work? Stop being selfish. Stop expecting the world to operate on your terms for you. And I'm telling you, Satan has sold this lie so well that it's almost a universal concept that we all believe it without even thinking about it. If I get what I want, I'll be happy. And it's an empty lie. Second misconception. And this one's really directed toward those in you know, leadership like pastors and leaders in the church. Uh, and that is this. Churches often try to kind of guilt people into finding others. In the name of Christ. Uh, what we call doing evangelism. If you grew up in church, uh, any kind of experience like mine, there was uh, the, the pastor would always say, you, you, people out there, you need to do evangelism. You need to go share your faith. You need to do it. We'd have designated nights to show up at church and go do it. If you love Jesus, you'll come to visitation on Monday. And three of us love Jesus enough to show up for visitation on Mondays. And We'd go out and, and, you know, do stuff that was never joy-inducing. We're going to go knock on doors. Oh, no. Look, can I just tell you, I've knocked on a thousand doors in my life. I never rejoiced in any of it. Okay? I'm doing it because I love Jesus. I don't really want to be doing this. It's awful. Share your faith. I have to share my faith. Let's go. Come on. We're going to go share our faith. We have to if we love Jesus. And, and can I just tell you that guilt is a, a never what God travels in. God does not travel in guilt. Okay, think about it. When was any time that you've rejoiced because you did something because you felt guilty about it? Right? I guess we got to go over to mom's house. How long do we have to stay? Right there. That's an indication of guilt and you're not going to have a good time because no one ever says, we're going to have a great time. How long do we have to stay? Right? We're going to go to Hawaii. How long do we have to stay? It's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't compute that way. God does not travel in guilt. Guilt is what Satan piles on. By the way, God travels in conviction. In other words, if you're a follower of Christ, you know how this works. You do something you're not supposed to do. You already know it when you're doing it. And the Holy Spirit says, hey, knock it off. If you don't knock it off, if you continue to live in rebellion, you're miserable does not produce joy. But if at that moment when God says, knock it off, you say, I'm sorry, I won't do that again, I repent, what happens? You experience the forgiveness of God that flows into your life because God smiles on you and you rejoice. There is joy in your life. See, that's what God does. God speaks conviction. We respond, joy. Satan wants to keep reminding us of how we screwed up. That's guilt. That is not God. I don't know why my brethren want to travel in guilt. Guilt is not joy producing it is not what god describes in terms of luke 15 kind of finding people so um, it's a lie that he's convinced a lot of preachers to sell because we're human too so joy increases in our lives first of all when we're grateful for god's blessings when you are thankful that God has loved you and wants you to be part of his family, when you are thankful that, that God has forgiven you of all your sins through the sacrifice of Jesus, when you are thankful that heaven is your home and nothing in this world can change that, it increases our joy. Secondly, our joy increases when we serve others, especially our friends and our family and our loved ones that need to be found. So how is your life connected to the mission of Christ? Well, I've already mentioned some of the ways. 
Some of you are already doing it just simply because you're inviting your friends. Whether they show up or not, you're not in control of that, but you're in control of whether you invite your friends and your family to come to church with you to meet Christ. That's huge. When you invite your friends, that's beautiful. And you go, hey, I, I need to invite them to church because they, they need some hope in their life. They need some healing in their life. Uh, they need some joy in their life. But maybe uh, there's other ways you can support the mission, like being involved in our community service projects. You know, we serve our community because we want to know that Calvary loves them because God loves them. And we just want to go serve people and, because as we do that, it opens the door for us to invite people to come to church, come experience the love of God. It's so simple. It's, it's a way to intentionally say, I'm going to help fulfill the mission and your joy is going to increase. Or maybe you go, hey, you know what I want to do? I want to take care of babies so that when moms and dads come here, they can come in and worship and they can experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus. So I'm going to volunteer to work with our children like once a month or once a quarter just because I'm good at taking care of kids and I can do that for an hour. You know, because we got worship on either sides of the hour. Well, not this one. You can't, can't worship after this. Not, not here. You can't worship. It's not, not in this place. You guys get the idea that you, there's so many ways you can do it. You can be a greeter and welcome people and smile and shake their hand and, and let them know that they're wanted in a physical way that God wants them to be part of this family. You see, what matters is whether you have a title or not, whether you have a job description or not, that you are intentionally saying, Jesus, I want to be connected to your mission. I want to make a difference in somebody's life. I want to lead them toward life change. We do this because Jesus has changed our lives. And because Jesus has changed our lives, we celebrate. I hope you celebrate because Jesus has changed your life. I hope you're rejoicing because your sins are forgiven and because you have eternal life. Because you are loved by God and wanted by God. And then... When our friends and our family experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus, we go nuts. We celebrate. Look, if you've been a part of that, of seeing your friends, your loved ones come to faith in Christ, it is, it is so exciting. It is so thrilling. All you want to do is throw a party. Joy is real. It's present. It's remarkable. So are you rejoicing? Are you on mission with Jesus? Maybe more importantly, have you been found by Jesus? Let's pray.